Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, recent data shows that this economy is in fact still very strong. Employment is good, the rate of inflation is high as expected, and the future, at least the very near-term future, looks bright. I'm Chris William, and welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business, policy, and public affairs seen each week across North and South Carolina for more than 30 years now. We will start our discussion about those issues at hand here in the Carolinas. And later on, he's the president of Triangle North Carolina-based MDC. John Simpkins joins us, and we hope you will too. We start now. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Mark Farris from the Greenville Area Development Corporation, Ashish Aklakar of Near You, and special guest, John Simpkins, President and CEO of MDC. So one of the biggest numbers that came out uh, this past Friday morning was this issue around employment numbers, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Gentlemen, welcome both to Sheesh Mark, good to see you. Mark, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, Greenville, upstate South Carolina, has had a pretty amazing uh, a year over year growth when it comes to capital investment and growth uh, around investment, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. But it kind of stands in contrast to this idea of what we've talked about historically around a labor shortage, you know, this mismatch. Is it a crisis point, Mark? And is it sustainable because it's been, we've been talking about this for seemingly years now. Yeah, the, the, it is at a crisis point, at least in terms of labor. You know, the availability of skilled labor is the number one issue for prospects. We either win or lose projects based on our ability to convince them they'll find those folks. The growth itself is phenomenal in terms of residential, commercial, and industrial. You know, we're starting to compete for land use now. We have so many of our sites that are uh, that are well located, have utilities, they're attractive to residential and to industrial, and we're actually beginning to compete for that land use now, which is troubling. She, same question in the home services business, in the home investment business, in, in construction, in maintenance, et cetera. It, I mean, labor, labor has got to be one of the biggest issues, is it? It has been, it continues to be, and if someone doesn't proactively address that, it will become a crisis very, very soon. Uh, I agree with Mark that we are kind of on the cusp of the crisis. And the, the gap between the skills that the available talent has versus what is needed in the market is just increasing day by day. So we have to address it proactively. Yeah, well, I wanna push you both on this a little bit, be a, a little provocative. Um, Mark, again, we, we've talked about that it's a crisis. It's almost as if the boy that cried wolf or chicken little saying the sky falling. Yes, it is. It, it, it has been an issue, but can, but we've been sustaining this shortage and it certainly got worse under COVID. But I, I, I think the question I'm trying to get to is, as, as Ashish just said, it's, it, it will be a crisis and someone needs to address it. How do we address it? And when do we reach a tipping point where some of those investments in Greenville County will look elsewhere because they can't find the headcount? Yeah, I think, I think how we address it, Chris, is kind of a dual stage. We have about 35 people a day that move to Greenville. We market that, certainly. We, we talk about that because we are adding to the workforce. At the same time, we've got some pretty aggressive programs. Greenville Tech, Clemson University, mm -hmm. uh, our local school system. We just opened our first uh, STEM high school in, in Greenville. So, so it's kind of a dual track. We're trying to educate our way out of it, but we're also 
really focused on talent attraction and, and convincing smart young people to move to Greenville. Is that the answer, Ashish? It is the answer. And I would add a couple more things to what Mark said. You know, we look at it from a three-fold perspective. Uh, where do you look for talent? And historically, the amount of diversity in the skill trades, which is what uh, my company is focused on, has been very low. And so we have to expand the pool and look at bringing more women in the industry, look at bringing more people of color in the industry. And that is that expansion of that uh, pool where we look for talent is very necessary. Second is what Mark hit on, like how do we talk to uh, these potential candidates and how do we make it attractive for them to have a long-term career path, not just an hourly job uh, in the trades. And third is how do we treat the talent once they come in our system? That is very, very important, right? As the workforce is shifting more and more towards millennials, it becomes really important that enterprises take uh, note of that, adjust their ecosystems to be compatible with millennial workforce, bring the right type of technology, right type of training uh, in, in, the, in the businesses so that these potential employees will, will find it a long-term home. That's very, very important. Ashish, how do you how do you loosen up this idea of getting the, uh, the 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 folks that have been on the sideline, and what we call the labor participation rate that has dropped so dramatically? How do you get them back in? How do you entice folks to get serious about looking for a job again? Do you have a formula for that? And you know, I, w- I wish I had a formula, but we have an understanding for you know what what it takes, and and the key to that is understanding uh, what these people are solving for, right? Um, uh, is it pay, is it benefits, is it work-life balance? Is it a happy workplace where they would like to come enjoy working for those companies? We have to really understand the target audience in terms of potential employees. And uh, people have overlooked that because it has been a very reactive approach. You know, whenever you lose an employee, you try to find one and that doesn't help for the longer term. There's only as many employees you can poach. And this one stat that I think is alarming, the average age of a technician or an installer in the home services space is about 55. So very soon, uh, we there is no choice but to bring fresh talent in the industry and that needs education, that needs uh, explaining to them what the financial reward would be, but also the purpose behind the financial reward. Uh, these, these trades are much more than just an hourly job. Uh, they do a lot for the customers that we serve and that purpose has to be made clear as we go to the market with these uh, potential candidates. Mark, you you both, in fact, you both had, had used the term education and no surprise that education is going to lead directly into finding qualified workers. But Mark, specifically in South Carolina, Dr. Tim Hardy at the South Carolina Technical College System has been, uh, of course, on this program before, but also the technical college system as well as North Carolina's community college system have been tasked with this idea of, of, of getting that bridge of those <coughs> skilled workers, Ashish, and to use your term. Mark, is there something else that needs to be done around just saying, well, it's up to the technical colleges and community colleges. Someone said on this program not long ago, if we can figure out how to get to the boards of education or the school boards and have them understand that there is a need for them to connect to the, to the businesses in their neighborhoods to allow these kids coming out of school, high school, figure out where they can plug in. So is that is that a route that, that we don't tap into? Yeah, I think we're trying. Certainly, if you think about uh, getting to kids at an earlier age, talking about, for example, manufacturing careers. I speak at uh, high school sometimes, and, uh, and the first question they ask me is, well, how much money I make? And, and my response is, well, you know, certainly if you if you look at different kinds of careers, there'll be different patterns of, of, mm-hmm. of salaries. But but if you think about a manufacturing career, I emphasize that and and talk about the 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 availability of jobs that are very well paying jobs that are, as she indicated, career oriented that can create an opportunity for you to succeed. Uh, Greenville Tech, for example, has a has a baccalaureate first program in South Carolina, for example, at technical school level has a four-year baccalaureate degree about manufacturing and about STEM programs. And the, the, the reason for that was that these folks were, were certainly graduating at two-year degree programs with skill sets that were needed by the manufacturers, but they wanted more. They wanted to integrate these people into leadership positions. And so they added another two years for that kind of training. So I think if we get to them early enough, we can talk about manufacturing uh, being a career path and being a, a, a great 
failed to enter into. Ashish, how do you get to how do you get to those potential workers early enough? It is the same thing that Mark talked about, you know, working with community colleges, working with technical schools, looking at other trades uh, that uh, mm-hmm. people are working in right now that they may, they might not, their heart might not be there. So how do you open the windows for them and say, hey, here's another option for you that you could consider versus giving up and starting to work for a restaurant or, you know, not that those jobs are bad jobs, but we need to keep people in the trades because that's where the labor shortage is the most prominent right now. And going to all the sources Mark talked about, uh, expanding uh, the, the pool of talent you can go to. You know, I talked about women, people of color. Those are very critical aspects that we should be working on yesterday. Mark, uh, we've got about 30 seconds. Let's pivot just for a second on, on an issue that's, that's you probably take a lot more than 30 seconds on supply chain. Uh, Jim Newsom, president or the CEO of the South Carolina Ports Authority, was on this program not long ago talking about that and addressing that. But where you are and what you do and the constituents that you see, how long do you see the supply chain being an issue? And what, what do you think you can do to uh, remediate it? That's funny you asked that question. We have uh, had in the last couple of weeks, three developers in Greenville talking about buildings they want to build, speculative buildings, and they're being asked to sign contracts that indicate and stipulate when their steel will be delivered. In other words, <laughs> the potential uh, of, uh, buyer or, or uh, a group that's going to lease the building, they're, they want to know exactly when the steel is being delivered because that's an eight-month eight month backlog now. So, And I asked the same question. I said, is there any any kind of, of relief in sight. And I got some negative answers from, from folks. And, and you know, the, the, the idea that this is going to be solved in the next year is probably not likely. I see it uh, extending at least another two years. And certainly it's about capacity. We have to build that capacity again and, and, and you know, be able to, to, to get those products out quicker. And, and, and it, 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 when you interrupt the supply chain, it takes longer than a couple of months to fix it. Over 50 years ago, our guest's organization started at what was called the Manpower Development Corporation. Now, 50 plus years later, MDC is a real force when it comes to policy, thought leadership, and in general, advancing issues at the fore. We welcome now the relatively new president and chief executive officer. Please welcome John Simpkins. President Simpkins, welcome to the uh, dialogue and welcome back to the Carolinas. Thank you for having me, Chris. It's a pleasure to be with you and your guests. Thank you, sir. So, John, uh, let's start off with an easy one. MDC sits at this intersection between identifying and writing and leading around things like economic mobility, but also now diversity, equity, and inclusion. If you take those two not so insignificant issues, bring those together, Where do you lead now, John? And I say now because here we are almost post-COVID. How do you manage both of these issues that are are going to be on on their own pretty pretty substantial? Sure. Uh, Chris, I think we lead from where we've always led, which is uh, being an organization that that is first and foremost an anti-poverty organization. And and if we are an anti-poverty organization, beginning in 1967 with Terry Sanford's vision of both integrating the workforce in North Carolina and and promoting this shift from an agrarian to an industrial economy, you need to look at those who are least advantaged, who are disadvantaged. And uh, the the history in the South has been that those have tended to be uh, poor whites in rural areas and African Americans throughout the region. Uh, So that's always been our focus. And and as we incorporate elements of diversity, equity, and inclusion into the work that we do, uh, racial equity is certainly a piece of that, uh, a large piece of that. Gender equity is is also a large piece of that. All of this is really uh, intended to intervene at the areas of greatest need. Uh, What W.B. Du Bois said, as the South goes, so goes the nation. Uh, Well, we think as the Carolinas go, so go the South. And, and if, if we are to, to really shift the, the economic picture and the forecast for the two states, North and South Carolina, then, then we really need to be involved in issues that affect communities of color uh, and, and, and women participating in the workforce. 
John, this is this is going to be a, a fairly general question, and uh, it almost it, it almost minimizes uh, the issue around DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. And the, the question is, it clearly has taken the fore now, not since just the tragic incident with George Floyd, but in general, it seems like it is no longer just a box to check or a division in a in a business but it's really become much more effusive across the uh, across organizations even small and large business so with the wind at your back with dei where do you hope to take it what do you hope to accomplish with it a little bit more detail sure uh, one of the things we want to do is is make the case that uh, there's a business case to be made for embracing diversity equity and inclusion for embracing equity specifically if, if we think about, let's say, for example, healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, the, the cost of healthcare disparities uh, across the country uh, reaches into the billions. $230 billion uh, would be uh, infused into our economy if, if, if they weren't siphoned off by the inequities, the current disparities that exist in healthcare. One study would say that that, that would, um, result in an increase of over a trillion dollars into the economy over four years. It's real money. Uh, it is it is a real economic impact on the economy. And, and drawing on the data of, of researchers like Raj Chetty, who talks about these lost Einsteins, what we know is that uh, talent is not distributed unequally throughout the population. It's distributed evenly throughout the population. Opportunity is not. So it's incumbent upon us to, to reach out and develop the talent as it exists throughout the population. It will benefit us all. It will benefit business. It will benefit society. I think this is one of those areas where we often want to think about business and, and humanities as being in, in, in separate boxes, uh, partly from my time with the Aspen Institute, but also just from uh, my worldview. I see them as, as being extremely interrelated. And, and, and a business approach that, that has a human focus, that has an equity focus is one that's actually gonna be uh, more resilient over the long term. One of the things that we always see, if you look at, at, at institutions that have become more diverse, those are the ones that survive. The ones that don't adjust, that don't react to the realities around them demographically and economically are the ones that become stagnant and, and actually fall behind. Mark. John, I, I, you mentioned the Aspen Institute, and I know you had uh, great involvement in, in Greenville, uh, South Carolina, with the, the Riley Institute and Liberty Fellows. We lost a great leader in Hang Hip last year, but talk a little bit about those programs and, and, and your involvement with them. Absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd love to talk about those, Mark, because uh, those are, are two uh, organizations that are near and dear to my heart, and uh, they've they've helped to form my own view of, of leadership and, and what I've come to, to identify as equity-centered leadership. Uh, Dick Riley is a longtime mentor of mine and, and a great political hero. Uh, David Broder called him uh, one of the most decent men in Washington, uh, which, is, which is high praise indeed, having lived in Washington. But what I, what I appreciate about uh, Secretary Riley the most is his humility and um, his ability to listen uh, to a variety of different viewpoints and, and incorporate those into an approach that's gonna benefit everyone. And he doesn't, he doesn't beat his chest about it, he just gets the job done. The Riley Institute has been an extension of that. It's actually what, what pulled me back to North, to South Carolina originally to come back to my home state and, and teach at Furman. And so their work uh, the work that they're doing as a part of the diversity leadership initiative uh, continues to be really important across the state. And, and by the same token, I see the Liberty Fellowship as, as really Hain and Anna Kate's gift to South Carolina. Uh, it's a gift because it's brought together a group of leaders who might not otherwise know each other, who developed a degree of trust. That trust uh, manifests itself in some really important moments, especially around uh, the removal of the Confederate flag from, from the grounds of the State House in South Carolina, uh, and in other ways, large and small, where we can actually reach out to each other across political divides, across geographical divides, all of those things that, that compartmentalize South Carolina uh, 
the, the Liberty Fellowship has done a great job of, of knitting some interstitial fabric between those different parts of the state in ways that I, I think will continue to, to yield great benefits for us. Ashish. John, thank you for the very interesting dialogue here and thank you for spending time with us. Of course. Uh, one, of, one of the things I believe in uh, as I look at our venture near you is uh, private sector has to ask the what can I do for the country? What can I do for the economy question more often? You have a great experience shifting between public sector and private sector and seeing various initiatives like diversity and inclusion, philanthropy in local communities, executing them, having impact through them. What can the private sector, what can companies like here you do more for the economy, for the country? Can you shed some light on how under the umbrella of MDC or otherwise, you would guide us towards that? Absolutely, Ashish, and thank you for that question. Uh, one of the ways in which uh, we look to engage with, with, with businesses, with employers, is as, as part of that talent development pipeline in, in equipping individuals with an opportunity to move into roles that, that will improve their standard of living, that will, that will allow them to accumulate generational wealth over time, uh, and working with employers to understand what those needs are specifically, and then stepping back from that through a, a, a training framework and network that allows us to, to move people through uh, those opportunities to get to uh, wage-sustaining jobs. And, and employers are, are great partners in that role. It's, it's something that obviously fulfills the needs of the employer, but it also fulfills the need of the person. We know that there's dignity in work, and there's certainly dignity in work that allows you to, to provide for your family, to, to provide for some measure of security for your family. I see these things as, as intricately linked, Ashish, and, and, and we look at, at businesses as being vital partners as, as we you know, work with community colleges and technical colleges, the community college system in both North and South Carolina um, have had historic strengths and, and also challenges uh, over, over the past 50 years. But we see those as, uh, as, as a really useful point of leverage between uh, individuals who are looking to, Im to improve their, their lot in life and businesses who are looking for talented workers. John, um, let, let's unpack some, some around education and how it, it, it advances toward workers, of course, but in North Carolina specifically. And MDC has a pretty big lever when it comes to influence around policy. Of course, your own personal and professional history, uh, this is not new to you. In North Carolina, there is an issue going on around Leandro, and you, I know you know this. And not whether you think Leandro is appropriate or not, but when, when, when you watch what th this idea that the courts are compelling North Carolina and have now uh, put some pressure on to say North Carolina must comply to the decision to give all children equal, and this is my term, equal and fair access to education. When you watch this unfold, which could end up a constitutional crisis to some degree, what are your thoughts? What do you think will happen? What do you, where do you hope this will go? Uh that's a great question, Chris, and, and, and some of my thoughts are informed by my own personal experience. Um, I'm, I'm a product of public schools in South Carolina. Uh, I'm also a product of a period during which those public schools received uh, a tremendous amount of, of, of resources that made possible uh, programs and programming uh, that, that really helped to launch me. You know, I, I went to the governor's school summer program at the College of Charleston in South Carolina. That was paid for with public dollars. It was essentially a quarter of a million dollar investment on an annual basis. That one experience opened up my eyes to what was possible for me to move through the rest of the world. Same is true for the other 200, 300 students who are with me participating in that program. They've gone on to do amazing things and they still attribute it to that investment in themselves. This is an opportunity for us to be clear about investing in uh, the young people uh, of our state and, and our state now being North Carolina, since I'm a property owner here in North Carolina, but, but certainly thinking about how that related to my experience in, in South Carolina. But for that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, 
And there are, there are thousands, if, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of kids over generations who we will be able to, to look back and say, but for this, we will lose them. Those lost Einsteins are, are, are imminent if, if we can't come to some understanding of how to adequately fund public education, not to, not to depend on philanthropy or nonprofits to fill the gap, mm -hmm. but to invest in uh, not just training workers, but training people who are critical thinkers, who are able to be productive citizens of their state and of their country. Yeah, we've got 30 seconds. Of, why, do you think, why do you think a debate around education, whether it's Leandro or whether it's something going on in South Carolina, why is it so acute? If we all believe the same thing, why is it so hard for us to get there? We literally have 30 seconds. Uh, partly because we don't understand what the commons is anymore, that, that this is a common investment. It's not my kid. It's not your kid. Mm -hmm. it's, it's our kids. Yeah. Okay. John, that's a, that's the last word and it's a good place to end on. Uh, again, welcome to NBC. I know it's been over a year and you're actually in your second year of leadership. Thank I think you. Everyone is thrilled for you, but we're glad to have you back in the South here. Great to be here. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thanks, John. Ashish, nice to see you. Please come back. Mark, always nice to see you. Uh, have a good weekend, gentlemen. Thank you for watching our program. Until next week, I'm Chris William. We hope your, your business and your weekend are good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.